Back in July 2021, I hiked the Tonquin Valley Trail in Jasper National Park, which is located in the Canadian Rockies here in Alberta. For those who haven't seen yet, I made a silent hiking film from that same trip, so please check that out if you haven't already. This video is going to be a hiking guide detailing my experience on the trail. I'll also talk about how we picked our campsites, how we got to the trail, as well as what I brought on the trail. Just some basic info before the trip. Tonquin Valley is known to be one of the most popular multi-day hikes in the Canadian Rockies. In terms of difficulty, this was only my third time doing a multi-day hike, and this was by far probably the easiest one of them all. I believe that the trail is good for beginners, especially if you do it over multiple days, and the trails are maintained very well by Parks Canada with clear signage. From end to end, the trail measures to be about 44 kilometers long, and it takes you into an alpine region filled with views of peaks, glaciers, and lakes. We completed the trail in about 75 kilometers, and that's because we added an extra day hike. The Tonquin Valley Trail is popular for its stunning views of Amethyst Lake at the base of the Ramparts mountain range. Uh, Macra Pass was also another definite highlight, and there are also day trips into the Eremite Valley and Moat Lake for those with some extra time. It's famous for its variety of wildlife, which includes grizzlies, black bears, and mountain caribou. You have to make sure to keep a clean campsite and use the food lockers provided. Dogs are also not allowed to use the trail. In the summer months, the trail has a reputation to be quite muddy, so gaiters and weatherproof boots are often recommended. When we went in July of 2021, we didn't find the trail to be too muddy at all. I just wore trail runners and a pair of running shorts for most of the trail. There are very many warnings about mosquitoes. Uh, mosquitoes are a huge problem on the trail. Bring more bug spray than you think you need. Bug nets are also an option, and I wore my hard shell at camp to avoid bites. Nicole bought citronelle candles from the dollar store, which we highly recommend. This helped to repel mosquitoes when we tried to enjoy our meals at the campsites. To the book the campsites, we went over to the Parks Canada reservation website. We decided to do the trail over three nights and four days, just so that we could have some extra time to enjoy the trail along the way. For four people and for three nights, it cost us a total of $131.75 Canadian. So about $33 Canadian per person for three nights and four days. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the gear that I brought on the trip. First is the backpack. I use the Northern Ultralight Sundown. This is a backpack designed and handcrafted by a local company based out of Nelson, BC. It's designed for through hikers who hike very long distances at a time. So it's lightweight and minimal, but built with a very durable and waterproof material. With it being a roll top backpack, it's very versatile as it can compress to the size of a day pack or can be rolled up to increase the volume. For my tent, I brought the MSR Hubba Hubba NX2. This is a lightweight and easy to set up tent with an amazing reputation for being a durable shelter in three season weather. Nicole and I fit perfectly inside of it with plenty of space. Instead of a sleeping bag, I use a down quilt. I bought my down quilt from Little Shop of Hammocks, which is another Canadian company based in Saskatchewan, where all the gear is designed and handcrafted with locally sourced down. I highly recommend them. For my sleeping pad, I use the Nemo Tensor Insulated Pad. It's an inflatable air mattress with an R value of 4.2, and it's very comfortable, it's kept me warm, it's very lightweight and easy to pack. For clothing, layering is very important, and I make sure that I bring exactly what I need. For t-shirts, I usually bring two to three of them. Anything that's not cotton works. For bottoms, I wear New Balance running shorts. And when it does get cold, I have one pair of Patagonia Terrabon joggers, which I slip over top of my shorts. If it does get a little bit chilly, I have the Arcteryx Proton FL hoodie, which is lightweight insulation with a bit of wind resistance. And then for camp, I have the Cerium LT jacket, which is a down puffy jacket. And for a rain shell, I have the Alpha FL. I mostly wore this for mosquitoes on this trail as we didn't get any rainy weather. For shoes, I've made the transition from hiking boots to trail runners. Uh, they're very comfortable, especially when hiking on more maintained trails. If they do get wet, they dry very fast, so I don't see the need for waterproof shoes. For cooking all of our food and heating up our water, we use the Pocket Rocket Stove from MSR, which has been very reliable. As for water, uh, there are plenty of streams and water sources along the entire trail, so at most I carried one liter in my Nalgene bottle. And we use the Sawyer Squeeze water filter to filter our water for drinking and for cooking. 
to get to the trailhead, we left Edmonton at about 3 or 4 in the morning and got to the trailhead at about 9 a.m. We parked our car at the portal trailhead where we would finish the hike, just so we didn't have to worry about finding a way to our car after four days on the trail. From the portal trailhead, we got picked up by Mountain Express Taxi which we booked uh, prior to arriving to the trailhead. And they drove us from the Portal Trailhead to the Astoria Trailhead, otherwise known as the Cavell Trailhead. And just at the beginning of the hike, you do cross a little bridge that crosses through the Cavell Creek. And from here, you get a view of Edith Cavell, which is a very popular photo spot. Once you cross that bridge and continue on the trail, most of it is really just a flat walk through the trees uh, with not much to see. Though along the way there are some bridge crossings where you will see creeks, streams and rivers. As you get up to your first fork there are two ways that you can go. There is a bridge that crosses left. And one that goes right. Now, if you want the hike to be flatter, I would recommend that you go left as you don't really have to climb up the side of this mountain here. However, we chose to go right as it offered more views and I would actually recommend it this way as even though there is a bit more of switchbacks and elevation gain, as you can see here, uh, you do get a higher view of the surrounding mountains. And once you get to the top of this area right over here, you're actually able to get a good view of the ramparts mountain range right here. We passed by the Switchback Campground and we continued on our way until we got to the Clithero Campground. Uh, once we got here, we did take a little bit of a break. From there, we went down towards the, the Warden Station and this is where we were starting to be offered our first views of the Amethyst Lakes. From there, we made our way around to our first campsite, which is the Prize Point Campground. Now, I would recommend that you actually fill up your water over here at this point. First source over here, there's like algae and growth in the water and it didn't really look clean to drink from. So definitely recommend grabbing water from this point over here before heading on to the campsite. And we also did see some people fishing in this area, so that was kind of nice. So we spent the night here, and that total of the first day was about 19.4 kilometers that we hiked. On the second day, what we did is we actually left our stuff at the campsite and decided to do a day hike up to the Eremite Valley. Uh, we made our way up this trail from Surprise Point and right here at this fork, we turned right. And you'll see a sign for the Waits Gibson Hut and then some signs for the Eremite Valley. Now, as you get up over here, as you can see, there's actually a creek that runs through here and there's typically a bridge that goes through and the trail actually is this one right here. But when we arrived, the trail, the, the bridge was broken. So that kind of made for a dangerous crossing as it seemed as though there was a bit of a waterfall and a drop off just below the creek. So we didn't want to risk crossing the bridge, especially as uh, it would be pretty unsafe. From there, we decided then to go around and find a way to kind of uh, connect back to the trail. 
However, this kind of proved to be a mistake as most of it was bushwhagging through marsh, kind of boggy, uh, soft uh, ground. And it wasn't fun at all. Um, though eventually we did find an area to cross the creek where we thought it would be safe. We made our way up through these rocks and all the way up the Aramite Valley. Until we eventually arrived to Arrowhead Lake. We took a little bit of a break there and we actually decided to climb up right over here, the side, just so that we could see uh, the Aramite Glacier, which is actually situated right here uh, below the Aramite Mountain. So this area is all glacier. And from up here, you actually are offered views of some glacial lakes. By that time though, uh, through bushwhacking and going through some really rough trail, we were really tired and we were actually running short on time. So we turned around and we rushed our way back. And this time we decided to stay on the real trail. As we got to the bridge, we found that the water in the creek was even higher than before. So it was even more dangerous to cross this time than, than previously. So what we ended up having to do was actually going all the way around this spot right here. And this entire thing was soft, marshy, uh, like soil. So we were sinking with each step, bushwhacking through trees and branches. And we basically had to do that all the way around Chrome Lake. And even dipping our feet in the water of the lake at some point until we finally got back onto the trail and we actually arrived back at our campsite pretty late in the evening and we found that there was actually some open spots so we were actually were tempted to stay an extra night here as we didn't feel like continuing on uh, however we decided it would be best to move on so that the next day we could be closer to our next campsite so we gathered our stuff here um, and we just left. We, we went really fast and the, this 5.6 kilometers to the Amethyst campsite took us only probably an hour of hiking as we rushed. Uh, and, and that was unfortunate just because this whole area of the hike was actually one of the most beautiful parts, but we had to rush it just because uh, the sun was going down. We actually didn't arrive to our Amethyst campsite until probably about 9 or 10 p.m. And I, by that time, we had hiked 27 kilometers in the day with tons of elevation gain and through rough terrain. So when we got to Amethyst, we ate dinner uh, right away and then we set up our tents and went to sleep. The next morning though, we did go down to the lake uh, just to kind of enjoy uh, the water a little bit, freshen up, especially after having such a rough previous day. And just, you get amazing views of the, the ramparts and the lake itself. Anyways, from there we packed up our stuff and we continued along the side of the, the Amethyst Lake. Now this part's probably one of the more iconic parts of the Tonquin Valley, and that's just because uh, you do cross some wooden paths, which people seem to love taking photos of. Uh, there is a bit of a fork here, uh, and it goes to Tonquin Valley's backcountry lodges. And this was a detour that took us an extra 45 minutes, I'd say, there and back. And I would say, if you have time, you definitely could check it out, but I didn't find it to be anything special or noteworthy. Here are some clips of what it looks like at the Backcountry Lodge. And you can decide for if you want to see it for yourself. However, there is also the option to do a hike up this trail here to Moat Lake, which we didn't have time for, so that is an option. From there, we continued on back around and this is pretty much the end of our time in the Amethyst Lake area. 
and we were pretty much heading up into Macrib Pass. We stopped over here for a quick break so we could have some snacks, some water, and rest a little bit. If you were to continue over to this side across the creek, you would arrive to Macrib Campsite, which is another option uh, for a place to stay, but we were continuing on to the Portal Campsite. So from here, Macrib Pass, the scenery does change a little bit. It becomes more meadow-like. Lots of streams and creeks with open rolling hills and meadows. Lots of colorful greenery and flowers. I'd say this area was really peaceful and very beautiful in its own way. And I definitely enjoyed hiking through this section over here. It was fairly easy, I'd say, and pretty much just a a bit of up and down through flat, wide trails. Uh, nothing complicated or crazy. Uh, just very peaceful and relaxing. As you come up around here, you will come across the Portal Creek. And as you get to the Portal Creek, you'll get to the Portal Campsite, which is where we stayed for our last night. And pretty much from here, uh, pretty much the end of the trail you just make your way up and around the mountain here and uh, there's lots of open views of the forests and the creeks below you hike along it for the entirety of the trip back to the car so that pretty much was our four days and three nights in the Tonquin Valley Trail